What are we doing? We're in Ephesians, aren't we? Actually, we're kind of in Ephesians. We're in Ephesians light. We are Ephesians chapter 3, and we are studying the mystery that he refers to here. Um, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not. So he speaks of the mystery of Christ. And um, the, some churches, mainly the Catholic Church, still maintains that this is a mystery. That, um, well, th they hold what, what Jesus referred to, I believe, as the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And when you break that word down, Nico is a Greek word that means to conquer. Nicholas is a conqueror king. Uh, Laetane is non-clergy people, the laity. And so Jesus said in two different places in the first three chapters of Revelation that he hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Because one of the things that Jesus never wanted for his church was to have an all-powerful priest or clergy system that held all the power over the people and they themselves had the power and of course they were always enriched by that power which means they can basically say you have to give me a thousand shekels a week each family does that and I get to pick out my own meats from the sacrifice which was what Hophni and Phineas were doing and God judged them for that. So Jesus hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And it's the idea also that the clergy are the only ones who can really understand and know the mysteries of God. That you people in the pew will never know these things and we're going to give you some kind of bogus explanation, but that's only to mislead you because you can't know what they really are. And in that sense, they're no different than any secret society where the higher levels hold certain secrets that they don't tell the lower level boys or they mislead them by giving them a false explanation. And Albert Pike actually said as such in Morals and Dogma, he said, we misled them. Now, if I belong to, if I belong to, let's say this church, and uh, so Jerry's been coming to this church here about a month or so, and um, he hears me teaching on this and that and the other, and he's saying, "Boy, I can't wait till Pastor Mike gets into this teaching and that teaching because I think I uh, would agree with him on it, and I think I know what it is, and I'm waiting for it to come out with it." And then I finally say, "Well, you know, Jerry, I'm sorry, but um, you haven't been here long enough." to really attain to those teachings. So um, I'm going to have to speak to the people in a mystery language and use symbols and things like that because they will understand it. You won't. And so we can't tell you what it is that we really believe. Now, we don't have any private secret doctrines. We don't have a book hidden in my office in a safe that has the real teachings of Jesus Christ. It has the fifth gospel in it. Okay, we don't have that. Everything that we believe is contained right here, Genesis through Revelation. And that's it. That's the, that is the expanse of what we believe, but it is also the limit of what we believe and what we hold to. And if you can't, if you can find it in here, then we believe it because it's in here. If you can't find it in here, then we don't believe it 
uh, because it's not in here. So in that sense, that's what separates us out from other mystery religions. And believe me, uh, up until the 1960s at the Second Vatican Council, you still had a large majority of the bishops, the cardinals, and the priests who were insistent that the Mass must be said in Latin and no other language. Well, who spoke Latin? Priests. That's it. A few educated people who were the wealthy people, they may have spoke it, but beyond that, even the priests would say to them, you don't have the ability to understand the scriptures, which is why you cannot have Bible studies. You don't, you, you don't have anything outside of what we give you. And you only read the kind of stuff, you only read the books that we approve of and so on. They don't, they don't let you read anything else. And, uh, so that, in that sense, they're still holding to a mystery doctrine. My copy of Morals and Dogma has on the front page of it, in the, in the inset page, um, what they call the title page, uh, esoteric use only, uh, to be returned, uh, upon the death of uh, the holder or the keeper of this book. In other words, if a man died and he was a uh, Scottish Rite Mason, then his wife's duty was, and he would have probably told his wife this, uh, when I die, you need to hand in all my Masonic books, my Masonic Bible, uh, my whatever, give that back to the lodge, my copies of Moral and Dogma, because those can't be out in the public and um, so when it said for esot esoteric use that means secret doctrines that we can't just let everybody read and understand and that is the exact opposite of the gospel it's intended that everyone can read or at least hear it and understand it enough to say I think I want that and that's really all there is to it. So, um, when Paul said in verse 4, Hereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. If we want to know what Paul knew about the mystery, all we got to do is read. Because it was written. Uh, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get back into our study of these mysteries. Father, we do ask your blessings upon your word tonight. Thank you, God, for opening up our eyes and our ears and giving us grace tonight. We, Father, we enjoyed the music that we sang. And Lord, we are looking forward to being happy, every one of us being happy in heaven. That would be something. Lord, I know that you've brought joy into our lives at times, but I don't think I've ever seen a day where everybody that I knew was happy, including myself. And Father, I look forward to a day when everybody's going to be happy. No more sorrow, no more heartache, no more trials, no more temptations. Father, you're just going to wipe all the tears from our eyes and make us perfect, make us in your image. We look forward to that day. Lord, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thank you for meeting with us this morning. And uh, for sharing the message that you shared this morning. Father, we thank you for it. Bless and op open your word tonight in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, now, we left off. Let me get uh, my, uh, let me sweep this with the besom of destruction. There we go. We'll type in Mr. We'll use the asterisk. So that'll give us mystery and mysteries, um, which is interesting. Both occurrences of the word mystery or mysteries is used exactly 27 times. There are 27 books in the New Testament, and you'll only find the word mystery used in the New Testament. It's only there. It's not in the Old Testament. Uh, which I find, I find it interesting. I don't think these things are coincidental. I think they're accidental. I think God has an order to the way that he speaks. Now, uh, we know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus promised that to his disciples, it is given to you to know the mysteries of God, uh, but to others, 
Um, I'm going to speak it in parables, but I'm not going to give them the definition of the parables. I'm going to leave it blank uh, because even if I gave it to them, they wouldn't believe it. They'd come up with their own interpretation anyway, and a lot of people have. And so anyway, uh, he tells his disciples, here's what this means. Uh, in Romans 11:25, we're not to be ignorant of this mystery, how that blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That, I believe, re references the rapture or the translation. Uh, Romans 16, 25, he speaks of the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Now it's revealed and through the scriptures of the prophets made known. So the mystery gets revealed, how? Through the scriptures. You want to understand it? Read the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained. So you and I understand it, but still lost people will never understand it. Uh, and obviously devils won't understand it either, because they're not meant to. Um, let's see here. We're stewards of the mysteries of God, 1 Corinthians 4, 1. That means... And, and a steward, get this, uh, who's ever been on a cruise ship? Okay. The stewards on the cruise ship, do they own the cruise ship? Do they own the food that's on the cruise ship? Do, um, so we have already established they don't own the ship. They don't own a stake in the ship. They don't hold stock in the company. They're basically stewards. They're stewards of the condition of the boat. They are, when you have room stewards, they're responsible for your room and a, and a whole set of rooms. They're responsible for those rooms getting cleaned every single day. They don't own the property that you brought onto the boat. They don't own your clothes. They don't own any of that. They are the custodians of all of that. That means that, uh, and they like to hire people from third world countries. It gives them opportunities to have jobs. A lot of these people send their money back home to have their family live off their work and labor. Uh, and I like to tip them if they do a good job. But anyway, uh, these people are not the owners of our room or of our things or our luggage, but they are responsible for them. Uh, just the same in our absence, let's say we're out visiting an island somewhere or Lisa's out shopping or we're watching a show or whatever. They are responsible for uh, the condition of the room, the cleanliness of the room. They're responsible that our objects are kept safe and that we don't have anything coming up missing either because they took it or they let somebody in who took certain things of yours, and so on. They are the ones responsible. Stewards have accountability. You and I have been given stewardship. The greatest gift ever given to mankind. That is the gospel and God's word. We've been given stewardship of this. It's not our book. We did not write it. We did not author it. It was given to us. God told us to keep it. God told us to be stewards of it and to share it with others. But don't change it. Don't rewrite it. Don't take it upon yourself to make everybody think that this is your wisdom when it's not. So in that stewards have that responsibility. And so we are Stewards of the mysteries of God, which means that God has trusted us to hold on to these sacred teachings that he kept secret all throughout the Old Testament. Now that they're revealed to us, it is our responsibility to make sure that they survive the length of our lifetime. And by the end of our life, we have sufficiently uh, handed down to a younger generation, whether it's our children or whether it's younger people in the church or whoever will listen, hand down those mysteries and those sacred doctrines and teachings to that generation so that they can continue that stewardship of the mysteries 
of Christ. Deacons are mentioned in the scriptures as being also stewards of the mysteries of God. Um, now, uh, let's see, what was it Wednesday night? We were talking about 1 Corinthians 14. Was that Wednesday night? About the man coming in speaking an unknown tongue. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to get into that tonight. Um, we'll focus on that uh, on Wednesday night. Um, but we can, let's see, we, we can look at it very quickly. In fact, turn to 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 Corinthians 14. Turn there in those two places. And man, I did it again this morning. I, I stretched and pulled something right where my former... The former location of my gallbladder. And uh, it, it's kind of hurting me to breathe. And from everything I've learned about public speaking, you have to breathe when you talk to people. Huh? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 13 and 14. Now, so let's say that you've been given... Uh, you've, it's been given to you know for you to know and understand these mysteries. Uh, how many of us know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He died for man's sins? He rose again on the third day, and He's at He's in heaven at God's right hand. How many of us know that? We know it. Okay. We have an obligation with knowing those mysteries. To not let that uh, get above our charity toward other people who may not know that. Paul, we know from 2 Corinthians 12, had a thorn given to him in his flesh. And he, he states, the reason why this was given to me was because of the abundance of revelations given to me. Remember what I said about Paul and his schooling. He went to Jesus Bible College for 14 years. He is learning his doctrines right from the mouth of Christ. Now, I'll be honest with you. You know, I've had times where I felt like God was showing me things. I get them from the Bible and I get them from the same Bible you have. So you can find them just like I can. I couldn't lay claim to any notion where God spoke to me privately Gave me an, a new understanding of something in the Bible that no one will, would have ever gotten if you weren't me. People do that, however. Especially those of a Pentecostal or charismatic persuasion. Where they believe that God is still giving private prophecies. Private words of wisdom, words of knowledge to people. And they're all the time prophesying over everybody. Oh, I got a prophecy for you. God said, God said this is going to happen. God's going to do this with you. God's going to do... Nine times out of ten, you got to figure out they're making that stuff up. And it's just a bunch of hooey. But they, they are pretending to know these things to magnify themselves over and above everybody else. But that's not charity. So in 1 Corinthians... 13, uh, G, uh, Paul said in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal in a, in a band or an orchestra or a, a, wood, a, a wind ensemble, which is like trumpets and clarinets and flutes and saxophones and things like that. Um, there would be a gong, a pair of cymbals, and a, 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 a triangle. You could, if you were really good, you could tinky, tinky, tink on that triangle. And that, you made, that made you really special. But the gong, the cymbals, the triangle, the sounding brass, they don't make a, a discernible Sound. In other words, you can't identify what key that's played in. And that's what he's saying. You make a noise, but nobody knows what it means. 
Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. So you might study the Bible, you might consider yourself a Bible student, and you study all the time, and you've acquired quite a bit of knowledge. And I've seen this on Facebook. People who sit and they study and they read and they read and they read and they acquire a bunch of knowledge and their sole intention with that knowledge is to use it against everybody else. And so they set you up to put you in a trap, lead you into some sort of snare that they've set for you. And when you don't answer a certain question exactly the right, perfect way that they want you to, Boy, they'll go after you. They'll nail you. They'll get on you. They'll call you a heretic. They'll call you, oh, I knew you were like that. You're a heretic. I've had them call, make videos about me and so on. And the truth of it is, they have a lot of knowledge. They don't have any charity. And charity is the kind of love where you give the love away Love it, that charity is a giving love. You give with no expectation of return whatsoever. When God gave His Son to the entire world, did He intend to leave anybody out? No. It was to the entire world. Now we know most of the entire world has rejected and will continue to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God still sent Him to the cross anyway. For all of the people that hate him. He sent, it, he sent Jesus to the cross. Jesus went and happily died on the cross for all the sins of mankind. And that's, that's charity. That's, uh, I've said this before, that's going to your wife and saying, Honey, I sure love you. You look very pretty today. And, uh, you know, she might say, Okay, what did you do? What happened? Nothing. Then why are you saying this to me? I just, I don't know. My heart's just full of love and I thought I'd express that to you. I just want to tell you I love you and I care about you. And um, whether you say it back to me or not is of no consequence because I'm going to love you no matter what. When we make an oath in a wedding ceremony... Through good times or bad... No, okay, what's the joke? What's so funny? <laughs> yeah. You had, a, you had a fever there, darling? We promise to love and to cherish uh, through thick and thin, in sickness and in health, uh, for better or for worse. Um... And that's how it is. We promise to give them that kind of charity love toward them. And But if you've vaunted yourself, because knowledge puffeth up, and if you've vaunted yourself above everybody else with your knowledge and with your doctrines and you know the mysteries and so on, you're no good. God cannot use you and He won't use you because you don't love people. You don't care enough about them. You're hoping... That they don't know what you know because you're, you're hoping then to catch a majority of the people in this ignorance trap where they didn't study all the things you studied and so you can exalt yourself above them. And Paul said, can't use you. You're absolutely no good. You are, you, you have this, you have this knowledge, you have the knowledge of the mysteries. But you do not have charity and you're good for nothing. So in um, over in chapter 14, um, in verse 1, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, uh, but rather that you may prophesy. And then verse 2, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue... Speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now, we covered that Wednesday night, and I, I ran a scenario by you. What if Paul is not re referencing something that's happened in the past? What if Paul is referencing something that is going to happen 
in, let's say, our future. Let's say a, 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 a man comes in. We do not recognize him. He has the appearance of a man, but a lot of angels do. And all of a sudden he comes in and he starts speaking in a language that no one, not only do we not know it, we've never even heard it. We've never heard the accent before. We've never heard these words before. We have no idea what he's saying. And he reels that out as if he has some big thing to share with everybody. And at the end of it, everybody's just going, who is this guy? And why is he speaking these mysteries? Because they make no sense to us. Um, and I'll give you an example. A lot of uh, what I'll call false religions generally have as one of their primary important doctrines is that the fact that there is usually a language that is the most holy language to that particular group with Hindu it's Sanskrit. And if you ever get into yoga or mindfulness, which you don't do, but if you get into that, you're going to, they're going to teach you Sanskrit words that they say you must use these terms because there's no term in any other language to describe what these terms are. The word, you've heard of uh, people meditating and them using the phrase om. Om, Om. You know what that word means? It doesn't. The word Om, a spoken word, has absolutely no definition to it whatsoever. So it's a, a voided word. And yet, they teach you that the truest way to make contact with the 330 million gods that the Hindus believe in is by meditating on the word Om. And when it brings you into a higher state of consciousness and you have emptied your mind, you can achieve nirvana, which means nothing. So you, you achieve nothing by speaking a word that has no meaning. Okay. But it's not just Hindu. Uh, the Jews are the same way with Hebrew. According to them, the only proper Bible to read is the Torah written in Hebrew. What about Muslims? The Quran should not ever be translated into the vulgar tongues of the heathen. It should only be read and studied in Arabic, period, the end. And it's that way with all kinds of stuff. Um, the Pentecostals, the tongues talkers will tell you that their tongue language is a sacred language that they communicate directly to God with it and God communicates to them and yet when you ask them what does that word mean they have no idea I don't know but it sure lifted me up okay that's like asking somebody what are you drinking I don't know but it feels good okay it's probably battery acid. Who knows? You know. But anyway, that's that's uh, there all throughout the religious spectrum. There's always a holy language that must be spoken or must be used in order to reach the gods or whatever deities you're trying uh, to get at. And and so um, this is what I believe Paul was getting at. He's speaking in an unknown tongue. Verse two which means no one knows what it is. No one does. Now, I want you to compare that where he says unknown tongue in verse 2 
Uh, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, let's see here. Here we go. Verse. Oh, I can't remember where I wanted to go. Um, Ah uh, well, I'm I'm just going to move on from it because I'm not I'm not prepared for it yet. But um, clearly, on the day of Pentecost, when they were speaking the tongues, they were speaking human languages that everybody understood on that day. There's just no way around that, and. For people to say that no, 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 it's a, it's a sacred prayer language that only God knows what it means and so on. I, I just, scripturally, I just cannot, I cannot buy that. Now, um, 1 Corinthians 15. Here's another aspect of the mystery. And I like this. This kind of fits in with the other ones that we've seen so far, where Jesus said unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. In the three gospels, in Romans, he says, um, be, Beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery, how the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. So behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, which means the sleep of death, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Just like green wheat stalks changing to golden wheat stalks, green tear stalks changing to black tear stalks, there is a change that has taken place. Now it is easily identifiable who is on the Lord's side and who isn't. And that is part of the mystery, is that you and I, when Christ appears in the air, oh, I love this. We're going to be changed just like that. Boom! Just think about it. It's, I'm going to say one, two, three, I'm going to snap my fingers, and in that quickness, hopefully all of us here are now clothed with our new clothes and our new body. One, two, three, snap. Well, it didn't happen. So I can't predict it. But that's what's going to happen. Okay? We're not going to fly out of here naked. Don't worry about that, anybody. Because Paul said that we don't desire, when, when we are clothed upon, we don't desire to be naked on that day. We desire to be clothed upon with new clothes. And God's going to cover us in his righteousness so that the shame of our nakedness does not appear. Uh, but it's going to happen just like that. And um, it is a mystery in that the world is never really going to know exactly what this is about. Uh, and at least until it happens. Um, and... I think it's possible that there are those in some very evil high places, um, very evil high places where uh, they are preparing for a day like this to happen. They call it, oh, what do they call it? What's the word? The... Um, Eschaton, the eschaton, eschatology is the study of the last days. The eschaton is an event that uh, the Catholic Church knows about. There are, believe it or not, think 
tanks associated with the United States government that have, uh, they get together and they discuss the possibilities of what could happen when the eschaton takes place. They're talking about it as if it were a real event. And it's going to be. Um, but they still won't understand it. They can't. Because the mysteries aren't revealed to them. We get it. Because we, we know that we're going to be changed. This is a companion verse to 1 Thessalonians 4. The trump shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we shall uh, be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so he says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Uh, and I've got to where when people ask me, when do you think the rapture is going to take place? I just answer them, the last trump. That's exactly what the, I'm not wrong, am I? And, and I won't be wrong. I hate being wrong. So I'm just going to say at the last trump. And I, now I might get quizzed. Well, oh, you don't believe in a pre-trib. You, you don't, don't. I just believe what the Bible says. I don't know any more than what the Bible says. I just believe what the Bible says. But that's part of the mystery as well. Uh, Ephesians 1. Let's see here. Verse 9. Let me back up a little bit here on this. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Now I get asked this question quite a bit from people. How do I know that God is in something? How will I know God's will? How can I discern what God wants? And um, I thought about it long and hard, prayed over it, went through various places in the scriptures. And I describe it like this. If God wants you tomorrow morning to be on a plane, let's say, to Seattle, Washington... And in Seattle, you're going to go to all the drug addicted tent cities and you're going to preach the gospel. And believe it or not, most of those people are going to be saved. And you have that in your mind. And you're going, well, I think that's what God's telling me, but I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, I don't even have a plane ticket. And then all of a sudden, somebody shows up and says, I was told to give you this, and it's a plane ticket to Seattle. Leaves at 5, 5.30 in the morning. So you go, you know what? I think I'm supposed to go to Seattle. And you go to Seattle, Washington, and your Uber driver, somebody just pulls up and says, um, are you looking to go to all the parks here in downtown? Yeah. How did you know? I don't know. But I just felt like there was somebody here that I should look for. And I think you're the guy I'm supposed to take you down to the parks. So now you've got an Uber taking you for free, mind you, for free, down to all the parks. And you're like, well, I don't know what I'm going to give these people. I don't even have any gospel tracks. And as you walk toward the little tent village, you trip over a box and out comes all these gospel tracks. In other words, God gave it to you. He put it in your heart and in your mind. And then he prepared every step of the way. It, Philip did the same thing. God told Philip to arise and go out of his house. And I'm paraphrasing. Philip, when you leave your house, take a left. Go down 12 blocks down to East 45th Street. Take a right. And start walking out and you're going to walk out of town and, and just keep walking. And Philip's like, okay. So he has no idea where he's going, no idea what he's going to do when he gets there, no idea what he's going to talk about and so on. And as he's walking, all of a sudden this chariot comes up with this Ethiopian eunuch in it. 
And the Lord says, go get in that chariot. And then Philip sees this eunuch reading from Isaiah. And he said, understand this what thou readest. And the eunuch says, how can I accept some man explain it to me? And Philip took his Bible and he said, well, let me tell you who this is. It's not Isaiah. I can tell you that. But I know the guy who it is. And he, from that place, the Bible says he began to expound unto him Jesus. And then all of a sudden, it's the eunuch who says, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip didn't even have to teach him about that. And he takes him down in the water, baptizes him. They come up out of the water. And then Philip, boom, is transported from the Star Trek Enterprise, transported magically over to another place. Just like that. Now that to me is one of the coolest things in the Bible. But that was how God, and the God that did that back then, is it well within the scope of reality that he could do it again. And it wouldn't surprise me one bit. So having made known unto us the mystery of his will, he may only give it to us one step at a time, but that's really all we need if we trust him. If we trust him. Um, Ephesians 3.3, 3. let's see here, where's my mouse? I need to fix this. Um, Ephesians 3.3, 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote it for in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Uh, and we've uh, looked into that, which in other ages was not, not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Uh, well, that's where we are now. Let me move down. I'm going, oh, this sounds familiar. I wonder why. Ephesians 5.32, this is, oh, I love this one. What is he talking about in Ephesians 5? The primary thing that he's talking about here is about the marriage of a man and a woman. And I'll never forget the day that it really dawned on me after I was married that there was something more at stake that was hinging upon my marriage to my wife being somewhat successful in that we have remained together all these years. Not bragging at all. But it dawned on me that, Mike, there's something more important than you getting what you want from the relationship with your wife. There's something more important than her getting what she wants out of her relationship with you. There's something way more important than the both of you put together. And it's the idea of what marriage represents. Marriage represents that God has a son and God is choosing a bride for his son and she is a willing bride for his son. He's not going out capturing slave women for his son to just hook up with. He wants a willing wife. When Eleazar, Abraham's servant, was sent out to go find a wife for Isaac, he said, find number one, don't you dare go to the Edomites or anybody like that. I don't want anybody from over there. I want one of our own people. Number two, she's got to want to do it. And that's what was asked her. Do you, you want to do this? Sure, I do. She was a willing participant. And so when Paul then gives us this teaching, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That means I, as the husband, am in the place of Christ. It is my responsibility to love my wife unconditionally. No matter what she does, no matter if she's nice, no matter if she's mean, no matter if, uh, if I'm the one giving and I never get anything back, which does not happen, it doesn't matter. It's like when Hosea was told to go out and marry a hooker, a prostitute. He went and God showed him which one. But Hosea like, well, at least she's pretty. 
And he marries her. He falls in love with her. And he thinks that now he's going to change her life. But it doesn't work. She still goes out and harlots herself. All of a sudden, she's got two kids. And Hosea's going, you know, they don't look a lot like me. And he sends them out now. Go find your mama because I can't find her. I don't know where she is. Well, she's in the slave market. What does Hosea do? Does he leave her out there and say, well, you old skanky broad. I could... He went out on me all over again. I, I, I just don't deserve to be treated this way. So you can just stay out here and hope somebody buys you that's going to be mean to you. That's not what he did. What he did was unexpected. He did it because he loved her. He actually paid the price. Even though she was his wife, he ransomed her and bought her back, redeemed her. And after he did that, she's like, nobody's loved me like this before. And it does change her. Unconditional love. And he said, this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Um, let's see here. Where, how much more have we got? We got a few things left here. Um, we have uh, Ephesians 6, 9, that, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Colossians 1, 26, again, the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to a saint. He says that again. Um, Colossians, um, the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. Colossians 4, 3, to speak the mystery of Christ. And next Sunday night, we'll get into two things. The mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. They are exact opposites of one another. Okay? Exact opposites. All right. Let's stand to our feet.